Here we welcome Mark Kui. So I've been at Scattergood a long time. Scattergood is a uh, small Quaker boarding school, boarding and day school uh, located outside of Iowa City. We have about 50 students, so we're very small. Um, we'll start just a little bit about the school. Um, the students are really uh, involved in what we do at the farm, both by eating and by working and everything else. And, um, and it's really grown over the years, um, how much that we've, we've had students involved. And um, just make lots of opportunities. I have, um, I have a mission that's separate from our school mission, and there's four parts to that mission. And the very f most important thing is that students be, be involved, uh, that the, the farm is a learning uh, laboratory for the students. And um, the second thing is that we produce food for the community. The third thing is that we do outreach to the community. And uh, the fourth thing is that we try to better the, the ecological impact that we're having on the planet. And, um, and like I said, all the meat protein that we eat at the school, we raise ourselves. So that's primarily beef, lamb, and pork, but also turkey a little bit, and, um, and some chickens. Uh, poultry processing is a, is a challenge in Iowa. That kind of limits the amount of poultry we have. But, um, but we have some really good relationships with, um, with other lockers around, so we're able to, uh, to provide all the meat that we eat. And then in terms of vegetables, um, this time of year we're still eating uh, beets, cabbage, onions, uh, collard greens, kale, sweet potatoes, um, did I say carrots, winter squash. We're still eating a lot of stuff from the farm. Um, we do have a high tunnel, but... Um, I haven't totally figured out how to manage that. I should have been here earlier to listen to Adam um, teach me how to, to manage my high tunnel better. I have no excuses. I think I've heard Adam Montreux speak like probably a half dozen times, and I still can't do everything that, or can't do one tenth of what he does. So, um, but we do uh, produce a lot of the vegetables that we eat, and um, and pretty much from August until December, everything that we eat uh, we raise um, minus grains. We don't raise wheat or anything like that. Um, and then this time of year, it gets a little bit trickier. Uh, we also grow a lot of flowers. We don't market really anything outside of our community. And part of that is because I don't want to be in a position um, where I'm competing with farmer friends of mine, those who have to sell enough product to you know, buy health insurance and put their kids through college and stuff like that. So we intentionally try, try not to uh, compete with those farmers. And... Um, so a lot of what we do is we feed ourselves, but also just try to create a beautiful environment to, uh, to exist and work in. And uh, we've also uh, spent a lot of time recently uh, adding restored prairie, both to our, our campus and our farm. Um, they're, they're geographically linked, but it's about a, a third of a mile hike from the school to the farm and uh, on paths through prairies and pastures and stuff like that. And um, it's a fun place to be. Like I've been there 23 years. My daughter just graduated last year. My wife and I got married there. So um, can't say enough great things about it. I just love being there. Um, so getting to the uh, task at hand, what we're here to talk about is a, uh, a youth educator grant that we got from NCR SARE uh, in 2020. And, um, and that uh, grant was to fund uh, uh, planting what we called an uncommon orchard. So we have orchards with uh, apples and peaches and pears and stuff like that. But there were some things that seemed like overlooked that could be grown in Iowa that we weren't growing in Iowa. So some more unusual things and we'll, we'll discover what those are later. But, um, but also um, growing those things with an understory that is made up of native perennial grasses and forbs. And, um, and this whole idea came out of a class that I taught so when students show up in August, we um, instead of just like say, like they've been free all summer and then suddenly it's like you know welcome back to school, sit down in a chair and be inside and look longingly out the window for eight hours a day. We try to to work against that and instead we start the year with what we call farm term, which are interdisciplinary classes that take place all morning out on the farm. So um, Quaker school, we start with you know some silence in the morning and then everybody walks out to the farm. We divide up into classes, and, um, and, and the goal is to teach you know, the social studies, language arts, sciences, everything through a single type of, of class. So I most recently taught one on seed saving. 
we were dissecting flowers, we were learning about, you know, cultural, um, like historic seed saving, um, all kinds of things. We learned about prairies and stuff like that. And we also actually started, like we had never saved seeds at Scattergood before, so we actually started a program up. And um, what else? Um, trying to think of the ones I've taught over the years. Oh, I taught one on fences, which was really interesting. We built a fence because I needed to have a fence built. But we also just looked at border issues and like, you know, how, what are geographic borders and political borders and all these different things. And just sort of, sort of considered this idea of uh, the history of barbed wire is so interesting. Who knew? You know, so we, we learned a lot about barbed wire. But just really looking at this uh, single subject, you know, in this case, fences, but come from a lot of different angles. So, um, so the idea for this grant actually came from a farm term class that I taught that was, uh, that was agriculture and climate change. And um, what we mostly did is we ran around different uh, soil types on our farm. We, we would collect soil and then do various tests on them. Uh, people heard of the underwear test? Oh, so great, yeah. You get some underwear and you bury it <laughs> and see how long it takes to decompose or there's a tea bag. You know, you also do the same thing with tea bags, with a red tea or a green tea. Um, and then a lot of different sort of lab-based soil tests. But we were like looking at our neighbor's conventional corn, our restored, we have uh, a restored prairie that was restored in the 1960s and another prairie that was restored just 10 years ago. So we're comparing those, our pasture land, our cultivated vegetable, it's certified organic, but, um, but our cultivated vegetable land. So we were just really trying to figure out like, what um, first? What's in the soil? What makes it, you know, unique to its own little micro, you know, environment? But um, also, what? How do the actions that we, um, you know, inflict on the soil? How does that impact? And, um, and it was really interesting. And then we also had the advantage that we visited a, a number of permaculture sites around Eastern Iowa and just were able to talk to experts and hear what they had to say. And um, and then it really became clear to us that perennial food production, sh shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, perennial food production with a, a native understory is, is a great way to, to produce food for yourself, but also perhaps um, uh, sequester the carbon to help alleviate some of the, the causes of climate change. So then uh, this is my third youth educator grant. We're kind of like in a sweet spot for NCR, say our youth educator grants because we have this, you know, we have a captive audience of students and, um, and then just a lot of people, you know, thinking about different ways that we could incorporate them into the farm. So together we wrote um, uh, this, uh, you know, YENC 2153. Um, I don't think there's anything posted yet up on their site. We had to ask for an extension because things got a little bit crazy um, when it came time to order trees because of the pandemic. And um, so we actually, the, we were just had our final approval and stuff like that. So I think that at some point um, when everything is all taken care of, it'll, it'll be up and you'll be able to search it and, and find our results and stuff like that. So here are some of the photos that we did in this class. And, um, and the most important thing is, is that, um, that you can't really teach a class to teenagers about you know, existential despair. You know, like that's like nobody needs that, but especially 16 year olds don't need that um, because they have a life ahead of them to to, you know, sort of experience some of that existential despair. So it became really important. Like, what can we do? You know, that's the that's the most important question. So um, we did a number of different things, you know, just just discovering, you know, learning about our soil and, and stuff like that. But um we also built like a, a culture bed, which was really fun, you know, just as a way to, to get, you know, the keep that stored carbon in the wood, you know, keep that uh, present, but also helping to uh, to raise food for us. But um, I don't know, do people know Tom? Tom Wall of Redfern Farm? That's a, he's more of an Iowa rock star than maybe a Missouri rock star. But uh, that's a Redfern Farm, and, and they grow um, a lot of... Um, uh, chestnuts is what he's primarily known for, and uh, and has been doing it for decades. So, um, but it was really important that at at this class that we were able to say like, 
yeah, there are some problems and some ways that we could, you know, live with the situation is, you know, figure out ways to grow food for ourselves, but also figure out a way to the question that carbon. So, really good stuff. So the timeline, I think the, uh, you know, we got the approval for the grant in like January, 2020. Um, so we had some old pasture that was kind of poorly located. I had tried to farm it um, with vegetables a little bit, but it was a little bit uh, too erosive. So we only did that for one year and, and it just made me too uncomfortable, put it back in pasture. And, um, and I've had a little bit of experience taking stuff out of pasture and putting it into um, cultivation. So I kind of took that on and we just had a, a, you know, we have a small 50 horsepower tractor with a rototiller and uh, tilled it, uh, sowed some buckwheat on there, let the buckwheat grow, flower, mowed that, tilled it again and repeated with the buckwheat. So um, twice hitting uh, that area with buckwheat. The buckwheat, uh, the goal of that is to, um, to suppress the weeds, you know, so we, we Killing kind of killed, it was mostly brome that was left, brome and some red clover. And um, so the tilling kind of helped take that out. But then by tilling, you know, you're bringing up a lot of, of buried weed seed. So hopefully the, uh, the buckwheat would, were, was, the intent was to uh, sort of suppress those weeds a little bit. And then we didn't till again after that second. So then when we sowed the, the understory, we just uh, sowed on top of that. Uh, fall 2020, the students did a lot of research and just talking to these, these folks. And um, a great thing about uh, a SARE grant is it really makes you think about how are you going to include other farmers? How, how are you going to rely on the expertise of, of others? And um, so that was really helpful for us. Um, Tom, who was in that previous picture, he farms about 45 minutes from us. Um, Dean Henry at Berry Patch Farm, Nevada, Iowa. Um, much further away from us, but we did a Zoom with him and he's been doing uh, perennial agriculture for, for decades as well. And, um, and then Sarah Fultz Jordan of the uh, Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. Do people know Xerces? Raise your hand. Okay, great, yeah. Sarah is uh, based out of Duluth, but she frequently comes down to Iowa, which is just so good for Iowa. And, um, and she put together our, well, working with us, like the students researched a lot of different possibilities and, uh, and then interviewed her and, and figured out different things. Ultimately, when it came time to put the, the mix together, she did the mix, which is really fun, like the stuff that she came up with. So then winter 2020, um, I think it was about this time of year, January, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll order the trees now. And everybody was sold out. I guess it would have been 2021. So like December 20, uh, January 2021, everything was just sold out. So I got an extension on the grant, said like, we'll just manage the understory for an additional year, which is actually not bad practice. And, um, and then we were able to uh, order the trees last fall, you know, 15 months ago. Um, we did sell the understory. We got our seeds from Prairie Moon Nursery, uh, a great, uh, nursery located in Minnesota. Um, we get a lot of our, our prairie seeds from them. And then managing that was just mowing it a few times. And then finally spring, like 10 months ago, uh, we planted the fruit trees and bushes. And this is the mix of the understory. Yeah. A lot of these things are just like minuscule quantities. And, um, and you can see from this point, these are the grasses, but then everything else is forage. And we were going for um, mostly low growing things that could um, withstand some traffic and uh, but wouldn't outcompete the trees too much. So um, Xerxes and Sarah have done quite a bit of work with uh, orchardists. Um, primarily in Wisconsin, uh, a little bit more in Iowa now. And uh, so they had sort of a, a mix that they uh, were comfortable with, but then um, with the Sarah Grant money, uh, Sarah was like, ooh, let's, let's try some new things. And then ended up going way over budget and then Xerxes picked up the rest. So they were really helpful in this, in this whole process. So. 
have people admired that long enough. <laughs> that's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's, that's lovely. Um, I don't have the eye, like I can't walk through our orchard now and identify. I can identify like four things out of the many that are, that are there. And it could take, you know, a decade or more for some of these things to really establish and get going. Um, but it was fun revisiting this when I was putting together this slideshow. Um, this is how, again, uh, so, you know, in the mail you get this box and it's like, you know, it's not very big, but it's, you know, worth $1,500. And you take out this zip block of seeds and it's, you know, you're just shocked that you think that you went into the wrong business. <laughs> like, that's, that's always my impression is like, why am I raising tomatoes when I should be growing these things instead? But um, so you get this little bag that's, you know, filled with gold-plated seeds. And, um, and to make sure that you don't, like, broadcast all your seeds in one area, you sort of divide your field up into any number of things. And then um, and you um, string those off, and then you just plant that smaller area. If you're trying to plant too big of an area, you're going to end up with thick spots and thin spots and all kinds of problems that way. Um, my big takeaway from this is that um, if you have, if you're doing nine areas, you want to have 10 buckets of seeds because you're always going to have thin spots and you want to be able to have some extras that you can go back because once they're on the ground, you're not getting them back. So, um, so remember that this is a good, a good takeaway from this. And here it is in action. So you can kind of see the, the upper right. So this, this is what we were sowing into. And, um, and March 22, a year ago, or two years ago. And, um, and we just call those spring mustards. I don't know what that is. So that's, so what you're seeing there is kind of a problem plant. They, uh, it's a, a really early season mustard that, that uh, flowers really readily. So that's an important one that we want them to mow before those, those flower seeds set. Um, but you can see the pink flags. So we had it marked off. And um, that's our middle school. Some of our middle school students out there spreading um, seeds. So then uh, the trees. So again, this was in consultation with, with Tom Wall and Dean Henry and, and other folks. Um, and again, recognizing that we already have peaches, apples, pears, um, stuff like that. So um, I ordered much earlier. We were able actually to get these things. So that felt really good. I had never heard of medlar before. Have people heard of medlar? It's supposed to taste like apple pie, but be mushy and weird. I don't know. I, I can't share like any results because we just planted these, you know, like a year ago. So I can't tell you like, oh yeah, quince grows beautifully in Eastern Iowa. Like we have no idea. And uh, I can't talk about medlar other than that we planted it and it seems to be living. So, but these are some of the other things. We hit the Asian pears. We, we grow a lot of apples, but we don't spray. Like, we're certified organic. And, um, and I just don't have time to really manage our apples. So they're kind of organic by neglect more than intentionally. So uh, we make a lot of applesauce rather than eating, you know, fresh apples. Uh, my experience with Asian pears, we have grown some Asian pears off and on over the years, is that they're just much easier to manage. You get a, you get a, a hand fruit that is much more appealing um, without spraying. Like we planted on uh, about 18 foot centers, and um, and most of these things we did three of these varieties. Some things we did four. And then these are the students planting last spring. Of course, we have deer and rabbit pressure, so we put uh, a tree shelter on every tree. And like before things went dormant, I was out walking through and it seemed like there was one, one quince I was kind of uh, unsure of. And then um, one of the plums was maybe not doing well, but out of 56 trees, everything else seemed to have survived. We'll, we'll see what happens, you know, in the spring, but heading into fall. And it was, we had a weird, uh, precipitation summer, um, you know, mostly dry, punctuated by really heavy rains, and then a really dry fall. So we were able to irrigate. irrigate. 
the tree tubes. So important. And, oh, here we're 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 hauling hoses around to irrigate. Yep. And then we did a a row of berries as well. And again, things that we probably should have been growing but hadn't been growing up to this point. Again, this is more of like a demonstration project. Like I don't have like data to share, or I can't say like you know these are the big conclusions because we won't know for a long time. So the the native prairie is rejuvenated by fire. What are you guys you guys planning on burning in your orchard, or what's <laughs> no, the plan there? No, no, um, and that's. Uh, yeah, so we do have the, the, the picture that's sort of in the background there is another um, prairie that we put in, and it's mostly forbs. And uh, fire, and again, I'm not a prairie expert, so if somebody knows better than I do, feel free to correct me. But fire sort of se selects for grasses primarily. So, um, so in this one that we've had going for 10 years, and it's just gotten better and better and better each year, we only mow that. And the uh, and the first year we mowed it four times and three times and two times and now we we only mow it at the end of like now I haven't even mowed it yet like I still have everything's tall to catch the snow because we were so dry heading into winter I wanted to, to keep it up so so we'll just mow in the prairie but we'll we'll mow infrequently like we won't mow until um, we'll probably select you know as the fruits ripen and stuff like that but we'll let it, we'll let it go. One challenge we had is that it was interesting, like I was seeing so much white clover out in there and I have to see like there, there are so many different, there are a couple different prairie white clovers that were put into the mix. And, uh, and at first I was like, where did all this white clover come from? Like, this is, this is absurd. And, um, and I thought it was a big problem, but now I need to get some people who have a better eye than I do and to come back and see like, okay, no, this is a native clover and, and maybe this one isn't. But we have had to do, go out and do some, you know, hand, you know, remediation, um, uh, sour dock, you know, it appreciated all the tilling I did. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> so don't, if you got dock, dig it before you till. So, um, I have a and question. Then, oh, and then there's been a little bit of um, burdock and stuff that we just go out and dig. So. Yep, sorry. What are you growing in your hugel culture mounds? Um, mostly cucurbits at this point. Carrots? What's that? I'm sorry. Did you say carrots? No, cucurbits. Oh. Um, so like uh, uh, winter squash, big vining things, because it's so hard to manage that. It's hard to keep it weeded that I wanted something that was assertive and, um, and that we could maybe just weed it once or twice, but then it would like sort of take it over. Um, we actually couldn't do anything with that for the first three years because I think that we were putting some pretty, um, uh, we needed the wood to break down a little bit more. And uh, Did you mulch it? Uh, after you covered it with dirt, did you? Did yeah, you we solarized it, it. So we just have some old high tunnel plastic that we put on it to keep uh -huh. the weeds down until we planted it. I didn't do that on mine. I just mm -hmm. made a little shallow hugel mound. Okay. And I grew the, I grew so much basil this year. Oh, interesting. Just tons and tons. Yeah. And really, I just threw the seeds. I didn't even bother <laughs> trying to space them out. I had. I just had a ton of basil, different cool. varieties. I just threw them all together, oh, mixed them up. So if you want to try that out, yeah. you cannot fail. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> we're, I'm with Casey Farm School in Kansas City, and we're not nearly as established as this, but um, we've been doing, we have a new 11 acres that we're, yeah, going to restore some prairie, do some community garden, and a lot of different spaces. So I love watching like the kiddos do all of that. Yeah. So it's like more of a logistics question. But like when you were doing the class and the design and everything, like did you keep most of that design on paper? Did you do it on computers? Like how were the kids engaged in um, like really being part of the design? Yeah. So. Uh what do you mean precisely by design? Like the were you writing on paper? Were you doing Excel? Were you were they involved like Yeah, when they were the... when they were researching the trees and the, the understory species, most of that was just like Google Sheets. Because then they could, you know, spreadsheet, share it with everybody, and then it was easy to to have um, Sarah up in Duluth look at it. You know, that was that was the easiest way. Um, it, it got to be a really complicated um, spreadsheet like every student had their own you know yeah and then uh, and then I had to go in and clean it up a little bit but uh, especially before Sarah took a look at it but 
but yeah, that was the biggest thing. And, um, and I'm trying to think for the trees, you know, there's just many fewer trees involved. And, if, and once we got past, you know, mangoes and stuff like that, um, it really, you know, limited what they wanted. But, um, but that was more sort of conversational, like, you know, and people doing research. And um, so it wasn't like every kid working on their own because there's just, you know, the possibilities were fewer. Okay, I'm just curious about the students, you know, are they like FFA school chapter or how do you find the collaboration with them? Uh, with the FFA? No, or, for the students talking? that you are working yeah, with. Yeah, so we're, we're, we're not like FFA, like, you know, we are sheep, we don't dock their tail, you know, it's just, I feel like a lot of production ag is totally different than what we're doing. And um, so we have like heritage breed, heritage, heritage breed hogs and, um, and, you know, we grass finish our beef and grass finish our sheep and stuff like that. So I feel like our curriculum doesn't really mesh with a lot of other curriculum. But what we try to do is this, the, the farm term that we do in the fall is really important. There's four or five different classes. And, um, and we just try to, to meet the students where they are, what their interests are. So they self-select into these various classes. But just being able to, to get them to sort of think holistically, you know, about you know, their world, you know, it's not always just divided up into little co discrete content areas. You know, it's often, the world is messier than that. And um, so I think that that's a big thing of what we do. And, um, but yeah, I've, I've reached out to our local FFA teacher a little bit and, uh, and she's just not interested in what we're doing. So <laughs> also we're like, we're organic and there's like maybe one other organic grower in our county who's like 10 miles north of us. And, you know, there's not, it's not, like we're, we're in the county east of Iowa City. Like in Johnson County where Iowa City is, there's lots going on there. We're in Cedar County, much less going on in terms of that. So I think that we're kind of the weird farming neighbors. <laughs> I just had a quick question about how you plan to manage directly around the trees. Like I didn't see any like mulch or anything. Is it something because it's a prairie instead of grass that you they'll be able to grow next to the trees or do you have plans for managing around them? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so what I've heard some from some people concerning, especially like wood chip mulch is that you just invite rodents to come eat your trees for the winter. So we, we intentionally didn't do that this first year. Um, and then we decided to really keep them watered and really try to give them a really strong first year so that hopefully, you know, roots are well established and, and the trees are, are really healthy. We're not going to spray herbicide. Um, I don't know. We'll have to see how it goes. I, I you know, I have, I, I throw a bush hog on our tractor and I go out there and I hit things, you know, when, it, when it's time to mow. Um, you know, next year I'll probably just do that twice. Um, but I may take a little, a smaller riding mower and maybe just buzz around the trees. Um, I don't know. Again, I'm, I'm here too early. Five years from now, this would be a much better presentation. 